I guess when it comes to building telescopes, it's a little like what they say about making movies or other art in that they're never really finished, they're just abandoned. And as such, I have continued to make improvements to the DBS-150 over the last couple of weeks. An auto collimator is, in my understanding, the tool for definitively collimating a reflecting telescope. I finally purchased one from Astro Systems. An auto collimator is basically just a mirror in a pinhole eyepiece that's used to line up reflections. You reference the center spot on the primary mirror and its corresponding reflections. The goal is to align the reflections of the center spot until they all merge into one. Astro Systems includes a triangle center spot sticker that you can see here. This is definitely helpful as the points of the triangle correspond to the three collimation screws of the primary mirror. The reflections created by the auto collimator amplify any error in collimation and you'll find that teeny adjustments have a huge impact. It becomes quite clear how this tool is essential for fine tuning the collimation of fast Newtonians like this one at F4. Here you can see how very lightly twisting the secondary throws the collimation out. Now I have a good way of determining if the collimation holds when the telescope is in various positions. If the reflections move when I toss the scope around like this, then I know something isn't stiff enough and sure enough, that seems to be the case here, at least a little bit. I decided to start by tightening up the primary mirror cell. It turns out one of the three Wiffle Tree supports on my primary mirror cell was a little bit loosey-goosey, so all I had to do was adjust the eccentric nut a little bit to snug it up. I also redesigned and reprinted the hold down ring to be more stiff. I applied some blue Loctite to the thread of the screws for the hold down ring. This is so I could just snug them up just tight enough without being too tight and so they wouldn't back out on their own. And once it's all reassembled, then I'm just kind of feeling to see if I can feel the mirror wiggling or shifting around in the cell at all. And it is not, everything feels nice and secure. So I'll go ahead and get this reinstalled. But of course, it seems like I overcompensated for the potential mirror flop with now maybe a little bit of pinching going on. You can see the stars here look a little bit pointy. There's a little bit of a point kind of on one edge of this star. I think with visual astronomy, it's pretty distinct. It's pretty clear when the optics are pinched, the stars look very triangular. But with imaging like this, there's so many other things that affect the star shape, like the accuracy of the guiding and the seeing that you end up with still a bit of a point, but the star is kind of mostly round. It's sort of round. So I think the pinched optics can be a little bit more difficult to identify in imaging, uh, unless maybe they're severely pinched, when it, in which case it would be quite obvious. So the fix was quite simple. I just took it back apart and just loosened that hold down ring just a little bit. I also realized that I had a piece of black gaffer's tape slightly covering a portion of the mirror. I put the tape to cover and black out the shiny metal screws of the hold down ring and I guess I didn't quite completely clear the ring, the hold down ring shape. So there was a little bit of a flat edge and that may have been causing some of that 
asymmetric diffraction pattern that I was seeing. And so here now on the left, you can see is with the tape removed and on the right was the old the old style with, with the tape on there. A little bit of a not quite apples to apples comparison as it's different stars, different star field, but you can see the diffraction on the left is uh, it's quite a bit better than, than on the right. I'm, at least I'm happy with it. I turned my attention to the design of the secondary mirror mount and spider, as it seemed that was probably the likely cause of some of the collimation shift I was observing with the autocollimator. I initially assumed I needed to use carbon fiber sheet for the veins, but thanks in part to the efforts of our friend Jay over on Discord, I know that 3D printed veins can work. And that option would be preferable because, well, it's cheaper, but also much more accessible to others as all you have to do is 3D print the spider instead of having to order or custom cut carbon fiber sheet. I ran a few simulations to try and dial in the design to minimize the displacement of the secondary given a static load. This was the test setup I applied a 10 pound force to the face of the holder at a 45 degree angle to simulate the telescope, sort of putting up and leaning to the side 45 degrees, a typical sort of imaging type of situation. And then I just held the veins fixed at the edges. Interestingly, the offset vein design used in the initial design of the DBS-150 showed quite a bit more deflection than the zero displacement design. Note that these values are not necessarily representative of, of real life as the simulation was greatly simplified. They should only be used to compare designs relative to one another. I initially went with this offset vein design because it was my understanding is that these were supposed to be more torsionally stiff. And well, that may be true for some cases, my data, at least this test, does not seem to agree. There's still a lot of evaluation that could be done here, but for now, this data is good enough to convince me to abandon the offset vein design. The largest contributing factor to increasing the stiffness of the design that I identified was the depth of the veins. You can see the difference going from 20 to 30 millimeters makes. Unfortunately, I can't fit 30 millimeters without redesigning the whole front end of the scope because the secondary mirror would have to move. So I opted for a 30 to 20 millimeter tapering design, not quite as stiff, but a reasonable compromise. I bought some Muso, Japanese black water-based acrylic paint to give a try. It's supposed to be that super matte black paint stuff and it looks like it's pretty good. It goes on nice and easy and that's actually kind of satisfying and fun to paint with. Most of the inside of the tube is covered with flocking material, which is nice and black and non-reflective. However, the back side of the secondary mirror, the secondary mirror veins, and the baffles are not. Well, the baffles are black, but the color of the 3D printed material can be a little bit reflective. I knew these surfaces were not ideal in the initial build, but I figured painting them black is always something I can do later and was a lower priority, so here we are.
I'm super pleased with the results I'm getting out of this telescope now. And I thought it would be fun to kind of compare and look at the results, not of this telescope before, but actually of the 8-inch Orion, basically GSO telescope rig that I used to have back in 2016. And here is my old rig set up at Grandview Campground. I had the Orion Atlas Pro mount, which was a very nice mount, and the Orion 8-inch F4 Imaging Newtonian, which is basically just a rebranded GSO Imaging Newtonian, and the camera was my Canon 7D Mark II. Comparing the new image on the left shot with the DBS-150 and the old Orion 8-inch F4 on the right is pretty interesting. My image on the left has a narrower field of view because of the much smaller image sensor. The Canon 7D Mark II has an APS-C size sensor and the Sony IMX 585 is a much smaller image sensor, so it's more of a crop factor, if you will. But if we zoom in and really scrutinize the amount of detail in here, of course the processing is a little bit different, but gosh, it's really hard to say. Maybe a little bit sharper, I think. Maybe a bit more detail and um, a bit sharper in the image on the left, on the new image, which is so crazy to think because uh, it's not only a smaller mirror, but a smaller image sensor and much smaller pixels, like almost half the pixel size, I think. Um, better, uh, in the, especially in the dark areas here. If we look at these, this dark nebulosity, over here, we kind of have a noisy mess. Of course, the Canon uh, DSLR is an uncooled sensor, and this was a is a cooled sensor running at uh, minus 10 C. So that uh, that definitely helps. But the biggest thing probably really is the uh, is the stars. At least the biggest thing that's a subject to this video, right? Is looking at the diffraction pattern on the stars. Much sharper, much more concise. And especially when you look at the bright core here. Now, both of these images have been run through a Blur Exterminator, have been Blur Exterminated, which will sharpen the stars. Uh, but the processing is going to be pretty similar. So it's a, it's a fair comparison, even though maybe a, a more fair, better comparison would be to look at the individual subframes. But I guess I'm more concerned with the result. But you can see how we have just a lot of just blooming and it's kind of all a jumbled mess in here. We just have much better color and then separation between the individual stars. You know, the extra diffraction between the veins is much more controlled over here. Uh, so very, very pleased with the quality of the images that I'm getting with the new rig. And just really cool to be able to produce these kind of images again. Um, especially considering it's with gear that I built myself, right? Look at that. My, the gear that I built myself is better than gear that I bought uh, almost 10 years ago. And since I've imaged M51 with both scopes now, here's a comparison of the two. On the left, the new DBS-150. On the right, the old Orion 8-inch in, rig. And uh, much nicer results. Again, on the left, the star shapes are much nicer. Of course, again, the processing on these is quite a bit different. But you can see the veins here. The veins on this uh, the 8-inch scope were a bit twisted, so they're kind of flaring out. And don't look that neat. A lot of this additional diffraction in the middle. Much better control over here. I do have a bit of a haloing going on, and that's mostly caused from the filter, and that's actually pretty easy to clone stamp that out, right? But all the other stars look nicer. And let's zoom in. Look at the, de the detail is, you know, I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, a lot of this could boil down to processing, right? We can do some additional, uh, do some sharpening in different uh, different ways on these, which will really bring out um, the, the details in the spiral arms on the, on the galaxies here. Galaxies are tricky, I think, uh, trickier to process than uh, the nebula, like the Eagle Nebula. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely pleased again. Uh, the the narrower field of view is better for galaxies, especially smaller, you know, targets like this. And uh, gosh, there's this nice look at these like background galaxy here. You know, and it looks looks nicer, sharper over here. So, yeah, very pleased with the performance of the new scope. Well. Ah. <laughs> It's finished, or wait, it's never finished but abandoned or something like that. I'm ready to abandon it again. Let's put it that way. Uh, 
it's um, it's great. It's working great. I think mechanically, it's it's good. I, the, the results speak for themselves. I just need um, you know need dark skies and an imaging time. Um, I'm pleased with the new design. The new spider works great. It looks good. Produces good result. It's easy to make and cheaper than carbon fiber veins. Uh, the black the blackout on the inside. I don't know if that makes much difference, but you know, you do it anyways. Thanks for checking out the video, guys. I am really pleased. This is like my new favorite scope, right? This is certainly for imaging. I really love that, the field of view that I'm getting. When I got back into astrophotography last year, I got a lot of the new processing tools like uh, Blur Exterminator, and those were not available to me uh, back in 2016 when I was previously doing imaging with that Orion rig that you saw. And um, so I went back and reprocessed my old data and it was crazy how much better the images are with uh, these newer processing tools. So I was editing those and just started thinking like, man, I really wish, kind of started wishing I had a rig to, you know, be able to produce images like that again. And well, I, I didn't really have that as like an end goal. Like I need to get, you know, a bigger scope and a bigger rig. It was kind of just, incrementally one thing at a time and improve the mount, build a scope, build a bigger scope. You know, I don't know. I ended up back there. Here we are. And this guy is producing better results than I had before. Very pleasing results. And it's, uh, yeah, look, it's something you can uh, download the plans for and print and build yourself. Of course, it takes a quite a bit of, um, you know, time and care, like anything with astrophotography and, you know, optimizing every little bit, right? A lot of tweaking and tuning to optimize. And there's definitely, still some things that I could do to optimize, but I'm super pleased with it. And um, I think I'm gonna move on to other projects. Well, I do have <laughs> at least one other telescope related project coming up. So if you're not subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button, the like, the bell, you know, all that stuff, right? Help out the channel. Uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. Um, if you have any other suggestions that could, uh, maybe you see some things in my images that could be improved. And um, the uh, print files, uh, STLs for the new, um, the new front end and the secondary spider are up on printables. Then that link will be down below. If you'd like to support the channel, you can join here on YouTube. Also, you can join my Patreon. And on Patreon, I try to give some advance notice for projects and uh, results and uh, print files, data, stuff like that, benefits for Patreon users. Also check out the uh, affiliate links down below. Um, affiliate links are a quick, easy, free way, no cost to you to help uh, channel creators like myself. And um, yeah, thanks again to everybody for watching and for subscribing and being here. And I'll see you on the next uh, video.